Okay, so I'm doing these videos about um, my favorite children's books uh, growing up, okay? Some of these books I read when I was younger in Kentucky schools, and they've had an indelible effect on me. I've, I still think about these books today. I come up with a list of eight, and I'm going to go through each one of them and kind of talk about uh, each one of them more in depth about why it is that I liked them, reading some of the quotes out of them, and and uh, and more fun, right? Okay, so my the the list of books that I've come up with is first of all where the red fern grows, right? Where the red fern grows about the uh, the coon hound dogs and um, and how the red fern grows in between their their graves. Not to spoil, you know, there's going to be a lot of spoiler alerts. Um, and then number two, uh, Race in the Sun. Race in the Sun is about a Navajo, uh, uh, Native American boy who gets reconnected with his roots and he actually races the sun. And something I've been wanting to actually go back to doing this and Race in the Sun is when you... Uh, Start in the morning at six in the morning. That's when he would go out and just start running towards the sun. And then, as soon as you see the sun peek up over the skyline, you race back to your house or where you came from before the sun comes all the way up. So you're racing the sun. You run out to the sun. When you see that it's rising, you only got until however much time it takes from it to peek over the edge to the time that it gets, you know, um, full blown when it's completely over the the skyline. So, Race in the Sun, uh, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, it's number third, it's number three, the third uh, book that I chose. The Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry is just an incredible book about racism and uh, it goes to the nadir era of race relations. Some people want to say it's the Gilded Age and some people want to say it's the Progressive Age. Um, the nadir era of race relations is, starts from the end of um, uh, Reconstruction until 1940, 1950. This is the worst era of race relations in America. Okay, this is uh, uh, Julie Chancellor out of uh, Valley High School. She wouldn't know anything about this. She is dumber than a box of rocks, right? She's also a white supremacist who's a apologize, uh, apologist for the white racism that had happened. She's like, oh, it happened so long ago. Who gives a shit? You can't judge something that happened in the 19... 90s by today's standards. <laughs> so she's clearly stupid. Um, but Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Oh my god, Julie Chancellor needs to read this because it just shows, like, it just shows a lot of awesome things, okay? So uh, uh, not only does it show that era, but it also shows how black folks uh, banded together black pride, black unity, black family, black love. And um, and it was really good. It was really awesome. Huckleberry Finn, the quintessential novel for everything, right? Of all the greatest novels, they want to say that Huckleberry Finn is the you know the American novel, the great American novel written by Mark Twain. Ender's Game, which is about um, you know a boy who's going to save the world, uh, unbeknownst to him, he's going through all this commander school and you know battle school that these adults are putting him through, which is sort of child abuse in of itself, right? Forcing a kid to be a commander, but they're sitting there saying that a child is willing to do things that adults aren't willing to do uh, when it comes to tactics and strategy. So they wanted some uh, an intellectual genius. And so, Ender's Game, number six, The Little Prince, uh, The Little Prince, right, by uh, Anton de Saint Exupery, right, Anton de Saint Exupery. It's just a great uh, book, just in general, it talks about life, love, um, uh, pursuit of happiness, it talks about the... Um, uh, sort of the, also the genius of children, how the adults have no creativity or imagination, how they destroyed, you know, this. the author is actually uh, drive to become an artist because they wanted to talk about matters of consequence when actually the adults don't know shit about what is important. They don't understand about things that actually, um, the real important things about, you know, things that are matters of consequence. Uh, you know, life, love, these are the things that matters, that, 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 that actually matters, right? Okay, so, um, The Little Prince, 
wonderful book. It was actually given to my aunt who fucking hates me, <laughs> which is ironic, you know, because it kind of teaches how um, how the the adults don't know what the fuck they're doing, and that's actually very true when it comes to Kentucky. Two out of five Kentuckians can't even read when it comes to the adults, yet our children, we have a smart next generation that's coming up, and we should invest in them and, and you know, um, do all that we can, set them up to where they can be in positions of power and authority and actually take our state into the next uh, century. So then we have Hope for the Flowers. So Hope for the Flowers, this is a pretty short book. It's no children's book, but it's about revolution and it's about love. And it's about, um, it's just about sort of the progress and it's a kind of a coming of age for kind of young adults, I would say, because, well, it's, it, it's an incredible book. I'll explain a little bit more about it, but it's Hope for the Flowers. It's a real short read and it was just so, it was just so awesome because it was just, um, so powerful, you know, so succinct, and it was just so powerful. So then we have Maniac McGee, and Maniac McGee is like one of my favorite books. In fact, I feel like I have totally internalized Maniac McGee. I totally read it and feel like Maniac McGee running through the train tracks in between white and black folks, um, you know, being sort of naive and and uh, uh, willfully ignorant about sort of the racism that's going around and how, you know, I'm not supposed to be on this side or that side and say this to the that person or that to that person. Um, so Maniac McGee is one of my favorite books. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So number one, the Where the Red Fern Grows. I just remember um, it's the shortest write-up of all of them, but this was read at uh, Crittenden Mount Zion in Kentucky in my uh, elementary school and uh, in Grant County. I remember Michael Jackson used to be in that class. Is a uh, It was a white kid, actually, who wound up get, who died later on, uh, hill-hopping and driving real crazy. And that's sad. I mean, that was he was eight years old. He was hilarious. He was funny. And um, I just wondered if we could have enabled him and set him up and harnessed that creativity, what more he could have done. Uh, I remember her, uh, the teacher read the book. I don't remember the teacher's name, but I do remember that she had started crying when she, uh, when we found out that the second red bone coonhound had died of heartbreak after the first red bone coonhound had died. So it's about this kid named Billy Coleman. He, you know, finds these dogs and has all these adventures with these red bone coonhounds. And he goes to visit the dogs' graves um, at the very end of the story, and they find a giant red fern in between them. And according to Native American legend, which this is interesting theme, Native Americans, um, according to Native American legend, only an angel can plant a red fern, right? So the first one had died for, I forget what reason, if it got killed or whatever, um, but the other one had died because it was heartbroken. And, and we've seen this before um, in humans, you know, when one person dies, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash is a perfect example of one of the red bone coon hounds from... Uh, where the red fern grows. So shortly after his love had died, he eventually dies himself, right? After he sung, um, you know, dirt or uh, uh, hurt, you know. What have I become? My sweetest friend, everyone I know goes away in the end. And you could have it all. My empire of dirt, I will let you down, I will make you hurt. Johnny Cash, okay, so Johnny Cash would be exactly like the, um, where the red fern grows. I remember the teacher being into it, how we were totally with her the whole way, and she broke down crying, and that was, we was like, oh my god, and, you know, don't cry, why, why are you crying? So an angel can only plant a red fern. These two dogs died, and so he and his family look at it in awe, and then they feel ready to leave the town, and that's it. That's the whole book. Okay, so where the red fern grows, number one. And I rank these in order from the, you know, the, the, the least greatest to the best. So I think the Maniac McGee is one of the better ones, and I think where the red fern grows. Well, I remember it. It's um, just, just very vaguely about life and death and about that <laughs> red fern, right? 
Okay, Race in the Sun. This is also a book that I read at Crittenden Mount Zion in the fourth grade. I mean, it's actually incredible how I've read many of these books in Crittenden. I was only in Grant County for about a couple years, and I was in Florida for one year, uh, but my youth was all in Gallatin County. It was in Warsaw, Kentucky. And I remember actually going back into Gallatin County and being, you know, just basically farther than everybody in terms of math and algebra and um, history. Even in, um, I think it was third grade in Florida, we had sex education, but in uh, Gallatin County, we didn't have sex education until eighth grade, right? And basically, half the class was already pregnant anyways. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. But, um, so, Race in the Sun. Okay, Race in the Sun is, uh, I think I read it in the fourth grade. So, it's about the, or th maybe third, I don't know. Twelfth, uh, it's about 12-year-old Brandon Rogers. He didn't know anything about his Navajo heritage. And his father didn't seem to mind. So, they grew up in white suburbia and therefore they weren't taught about their Navajo roots. Brandon's Navajo grandfather moved off the Navajo reservation from Little Waters, Arizona, and into the lower bunk in Brandon's room. So you got Brandon Rogers, who's, you know, basically doesn't know anything about his roots, and then you got his grandfather, who's sick and has to live with him. And so he's pissed. He's got to, you know, he's got to share his room with his old, stinky grandfather, and he talks about how he had a distinctive Native American smell. He's like, oh, he smells like an Indian, which I don't, I've never heard that. I don't even know what that would mean. Um, Brandon and Rogers, Navajo grandfather would also chant himself to sleep, right? So, you know, hi, yo, yo. So he's sitting there and, you know, chanted to himself. That's sort of like his routines. And the biggest thing that his Navajo grandfather would do would wake him up at six in the morning and get him to race the sun, okay? So, I would like to race the sun. This is something that I've been thinking about whenever I walk, like in the mornings, I see the sun rise. Um,. Uh, racing the sun is when you run towards the sunrise, and then once you see the sun break the skyline, then you run back hoping to beat the sun before it raises all the way up from the skyline or over the trees or wherever the visible skyline actually is. Okay, and and that's what he raced. So it wasn't just a. I don't know how long it actually takes for the sun to rise. I think that's probably important because if you start running at five o'clock, there's no way you're gonna get back in twenty minutes, right? Um, but that's it, it, you know once you figure out the times, if it takes about thirty minutes in order to get back, then you want to start thirty minutes beforehand, and then you try to run back and you try to beat it, and um, and so. That's that's what it actually is, and that's the important concept. That's the thing that had stuck with me, racing the sun, because it's like, oh, I want to race the sun, I want to race the sun. Uh, Brandon's grandpa, and it's also weird how a lot of these books hit me in my later years, right? So Brandon's grandpa's teaching him about the Navajo ways. He's teaching him, um, you know, just uh, about the racing the sun, which he was pissed off about waking up 6 in the morning and having to run just because his old grandpa is uh, in his bunk bed, right, in the lower bunk bed. He was teaching about the Navajo ways. At first, Brandon hated race in the sun, but eventually he felt good about the exercise. Uh, he felt accomplished after his first run, and he actually wanted to beat the sun, which he eventually does. So once he started, he hated getting into it, but once he got into it, he's like, God, I want to beat the sun. I want to do it. So Brandon's grandpa also teaches Brandon about planting crops and ways of farming and, you know, just basically being more in touch with his Navajo roots, which he had been disconnected with living in white America. Eventually, Brandon's grandpa becomes sick and he misses his Navajo reservation home and the fresh smells of the sage brush where he lived. Brandon helps his grandfather return to his Navajo homeland and he runs away with him without anybody's, you know, without telling anybody about it. All right, so carrying on, you have um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Okay, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, just absolute, just the whole book. There's a movie about it with uh, Morgan Freeman. It's just an incredible book. Uh, I'm not going to get through all of this, but it's just awesome book, okay? So uh, it's written in 1976. It's written by Mildred Taylor, and Mildred Taylor is from Jackson, Mississippi. This is also a book I read at Crittenden Mount Zion, CMZ in Grant County in the fourth grade. Uh, when my homeroom teacher was Mrs. Townsend, but it wasn't in her class. There were trailers outside of the CMZ building, and we had rotated between the four teachers out there, and it was whoever the reading teacher was. So whoever the reading teacher was, that's the person who had taught me to um, read, uh, or, or who, who got me to read Roll Thunder, Hear My Cry. 
And what I remember from it, I've read a little bit more and I've got, you know, I, I recalled it as I was reading it. But basically, the book was indelible because I remembered that uh, TJ had died, or at least I thought he did. Um, and I remembered Cassie, the main protagonist, which was a nine-year-old black girl who hated TJ but still cried for him anyways because of the injustice that was done to him. Roll Thunder, Hear My Cry, explored life in Southern America, the South, after the U.S. Civil War, a.k.a. the war against oppressive southern African slavery in the 1930s. So this is in the nadir era of race relations. Again, something Julie Chancellor from um, Valley High School in Louisville. She don't know shit about this, okay? She is she is, uh, she is, is the oppressor. She is a white massa, and she defends uh, whiteness, right? So the KKK defended it would kill people for white womanhood, and she very much embodies that white womanhood since she gets so much privilege from it, right?